Yeah, hello, my name is Achim Dobermann. I'm the Deputy Director General for Research of the International Rice Research Institute, or IRI. And the gentleman beside me here is uh, Lee Weil. He's the head of our experimental station. And uh, what we want to do with you in the next few months is actually learn how to grow a crop of rice. Not just any crop of rice, we want to do it in the best possible manner we can think of. Now we are scientists, so we do a lot of research. And we believe that we know a lot about rice and how to grow it in different parts of the world. And we have lots of recommendations for farmers and extension workers. We often call them best management practices. You can find them on, on the internet, on our rice knowledge bank, in extension materials, in books, in scientific papers. But what we really, really want to do is try to practice what we preach. Because often we as scientists may come up with uh, things that you know don't really work in practice or sometimes you wonder why aren't people using them. So that's why Lee and I have decided well why don't we do it ourselves as much as we can do ourselves because some of the things we may not be really qualified to do but we'll try okay. We will. We will be qualified. Well, this is day one of the great challenge. So our first job today is to level the field. Now, Lee, why is leveling the field so important and how do we do this? For wet seeded rice, you're dealing with a, with a seedling that is two days old, young and very fragile. And there's the two most important criteria you've got to meet early are water control and weed control. And in some ways, they're one and the same. So by levelling you can ensure that each, each seedling has a consistent amount of water or a consistent lack of water depending on what you're trying to achieve at the time. So we really think levelling the field is the very first and most important step probably to get a good crop established, particularly if it's wet seeded rice as we want to do in our agronomy challenge this year. Yes, we're targeting a high yield. And for a high yield, we need a, a good establishment density. We need a good number of plants in the field. So we need a good survival of, and, and uh, growing of the, the seeds that we, we will put out with the drum seeder in two days' time. And levelling is definitely the foundation upon which a good high yield is built. When you grow rice, of course, as a farmer, you have to choose a variety to grow. So we have chosen a variety called NSIC RC222, or in the Philippines, it's also called locally Tubigan 18. But it is actually an IRI variety, so it has also the IRI designation IRRI154. Now, why did we choose this? It can yield with good management easily six, seven, maybe even more tons per hectare. And it is a relatively new variety. We place a lot of emphasis on this because more recently released varieties are better adapted to the current climate and they can therefore have better adaptation to the yield potential situation, the environment that we have nowadays. This variety was released in 2010. And that just that factor using a more recent variety can often give a yield advantage of five to ten percent. Well, we began with certified seed. Now this seed has been germination, germination tested and tested at greater than 90%. Uh, it was soaked, uh, put in water 36, 36 hours ago and then drained about 16 or 17 hours ago and incubated for that length of time. It's, it's got a short uh, root and on, even on some it's got a short uh, shoot already. So this is about ideal for, for using a drum seeder that we'll, we'll touch on shortly. The root and shoot could be a little bit longer and it'd still be okay, so we've got a few hours to spare, which might be helpful. Yeah. Um, and the seed is, is uh, ready. What are we gonna do, Lee? I suspect the conclusion is we're not going to drum seed. Um, this is the depth of our mud. 
So as such, the, the wheels of the drum seater <laughs> sink too far into the mud and hence the, the metering units sit on the mud and fail to yeah. function as metering units. Do you do the... A few, a few yeah. metres out ahead hey. of you once you can. Hey. Just control, control. Just the little, 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 yeah, little, 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 little fences like, like this. You want to... You do like that? Yeah. See? Okay, Lee, uh, on a scale 1 to 10, uh, what do you think we've accomplished in terms of uh, spreading our seed uniformly? I think when we started the field, we were barely 5, but overall I think I'd give us a 7 or an 8. The uniformity is quite good. Uh, we're aiming for a plant density of 150 plants a square metre, and there's plenty of seeds in the field spread uniformly. To achieve just that, we can lose a few seeds and we'll still be fine. I, I had a lot of trouble initially, I was, I think, looking too much on the ground, trying to sprinkle seed in little patches, you know, and, but later I think I got the swing, you know, like the broad swing, looking straight ahead, walking and throwing, so I'm, I'm quite hopeful that I uh, improved over time, but uh, we'll see in a week, I guess, what emerges. What we have here is an area that's, that's representative of the, the higher areas of the fields, the areas that were, that were well drained. So this probably represents 50 to 60 percent of the field. The, the drainage was good, the access to oxygen for the developing seed has been good. It's germinated quickly and strongly, it's got uh, a green shoot very quickly and its third leaf is already appearing. This is uh, wet direct seeding as it should be done. These plants are happy. Now what we have here is an area that's representative of the, the intermediate zone shall I say. When we seeded it was too wet, it was a little bit too wet and gradually during the week it, it gradually dried out but it was still wetter than we'd like it to be. And you can see the seedlings are much smaller, they've had to fight for survival for much of the week but they are establishing and they'll be okay even though they're slow. The establishment density is lower but overall it's an acceptable result. So the seedlings were unhappy but now they're okay. What we have here is an area representative uh, of complete failure. The area, areas like this maybe five somewhere between 5 and 10 percent of the field stayed wet all week. They've only just become dry. Uh, that was too long for the rice plants. So here we have an area that's completely devoid of rice seedlings. All the rice seeds have died. So what we have is an uneven field, a non-uniform field. The drier areas have grown really well, the intermediate areas have grown okay, they'll be okay. But the wetter areas uh, have been complete failures, so 5 to 10% of the field, we're going to reseed to give it that second chance. True, uh, being seeded almost a week later will mean it matures a little later, but rice does have a habit of catching up by the time you get to flowering and harvest, so I'm not that concerned. I think in hindsight we were seduced by technology. We looked to the laser levelling, laser guided laser equipment, when in hindsight I think the small equipment, the, the equipment invented here in the Philippines, would have given us a more level field. So um, don't always assume the high tech path is the most effective one. So we're reseeding small areas, just the wetter areas, the, the drier areas where the rice is okay. That soil's now too dry, it won't uh, seed successfully, the rice roots won't penetrate the soil, so there's no point putting seed there anyway. We're focusing purely on those small, very wet areas with no rice in them at all. Now I'm also thinking over here, looking around here, there's an area with a rat fence over to our, mm. to my left. That's and now that, that can be good because if you do have a rat problem, last year there was a rat problem just here, it's good to have what we call a trap crop where you plant an area early, about two to three weeks early, and then have traps with multiple capture traps 
entrances like this. So the rats, they'll go in, but can't get back out again. Particularly after the fallow period, the rats, there's a big disturbance during the fallow period and the working of the soil. So the rats then get moved out, get moved to the edges and they aggregate. And that's the best time to manage them. How we have here, Trappy the rat. And Trappy is, is used often when I talk to farmers. And we will show that they will enter into the trap here and he'll force his way through. Trappy's and rats, big. yeah, Trappy's big, but see how they sort of crunch down? And rats can do that as well. The only thing that limits a rat, they, they can dislocate their shoulder, shoulders or whatever. It's the width of their head, which indicates as to how big the, the hole is they can get in. Mm. And with a mouse, if you push your finger in, a mouse can get into a hole. With a rat, it's more sort of a, probably a, a large thumb. So it's usually about 12 millimetres. If you've got a hole bigger than that, then the rats can get through. And so often, you know, you don't need a very big opening here, the rats will force their way through. What do we know about birds and their interactions with suited rhyme? Here in the Philippines and elsewhere in Asia, often it's this using of what you've got here, the flags, to just cause a bit of, of disturbance. Not, well, they have seen not far from here where they have a little, like a little windmill, a little ratchet on it, making a noise, and that's mm. the place to keep the birds away as well. So it's, it's looking at, at noise as a deterrent. We came up uh, after many years of research with uh, tools that farmers and extension workers can use and I'm going to use one of these tools here. So what I have here is a small tablet computer. Uh, it runs the Android uh, system and we have on this little tablet uh, an application or app as they're called nowadays uh, that we released uh, last year for farmers in the Philippines as a first uh, example. It's called Nutrient Manager Rice sometimes also Nutrient Manager on mobile. And it's very simple to use, it's all touch screen here as you can see. If you don't have an Android smartphone like this, you can also use it through a normal phone and call a toll free number in the Philippines. And all it does, it's asking you uh, 12, 13, 14 questions about your field. So after I've done all this, voila, comes out a fertilizer recommendation. One of the first issues with water management is wet seeded rice currently is really sensitive to water. If you have too much water, the, the seeds die. And uh, so that's why you need really good levelling. And secondly, it's why we really need to get anaerobic germination tolerance into rice seeds so that the technology is less difficult and, and less risky for farmers. So this field was lucky after it was established there was there were a few showers of rain which kept it going nicely. I don't think it's been irrigated yet, but Atkin's just applying fertiliser and so the ideal thing next will be to irrigate to wash the fertiliser into the soil. Uh, one way to reduce the amount of irrigation water we apply to rice is to do what we call alternate wetting and drying. So this means we flood the field, then we let the water disappear, we let the surface dry down, and then we re-irrigate again. And the, the, anybody can do alternate wetting and drying, but the question is how do you do it safely so that you don't lose any yield because rice is so sensitive to too much drying. So over the years, Erie's done a lot of research and, and they've found that if we let at, at the soil dry down below about 10 or 15 kilopascals, uh, soil, soil water tension at about 15 centimetres below the soil surface, the rice suffers. But 10 or 15 kilopascals probably doesn't mean anything to you and it doesn't mean anything to farmers. Some really nice work with this really simple field water tube, which just shows you where the water table is. You could pull it out, I think. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to pull this out if I can. Yeah. Yeah. 15 centimetres from the bottom, so you should 
push it into the mark. You can go a little bit further, it doesn't matter. Okay, how often do you think I need to come out and check this? Oh, well, it depends on the weather for a start. <laughs> and, uh, it's, uh, but at least once a week, right? Yeah, maybe at least twice, once, maybe, once yeah. a week, yeah. Now, today we're measuring the plant density in the field. The plants have started to tiller, so it's getting a little bit difficult to count, but it's still okay. I'm using a uh, 0.1 square metre, a one-tenth of a square metre ring, manufactured from some garden hose I stole from my wife. Uh, you throw the ring at random, preferably over your shoulder, that guarantees fairly random, and at, at several locations, so you get it representative of the field. And the results we got uh, averaged about 13 plants per, per ring or 130 plants per square metre but the lowest was one plant per ring and the highest was 32 so there's a lot of variation but I still think we're okay. Finbar. Uh, do we need to worry about insects at this early stage? Do we need to spray? No. Why not? At this stage, the, the insect damage is can be completely compensated for by the plant. So normally the things you get at the early stage are things like leaf folder, a little bit of leaf folder, and whorl maggot. Whorl maggot actually is the biggest problem this time of year. But as the plant grows, it just, it just disappears because the plant, as the leaves get thicker, the maggots can't actually eat the leaf. But, you know, I, I keep worrying, I see things on the leaves like this here, you know, yeah. something's chewed on it. This is a whorl maggot? That's a whorl maggot, yeah. Uh, so nothing to worry about? No problem. No it's, problem. It's just... Yeah. In fact, this is even light. It's not even, a, you know, a, a, a normal infestation of whorl maggot. What is this here? There's a, some egg mass on it here? What yeah, are these, are, these are probably some sort of parasitoid that has, so it's a wasp cocoon oh. and these are beneficial again so it's good news uh, these will fly off there's about 40 of them there so they'll fly off then and parasitize things like leaf folder um, larvae or um, other caterpillars so they're again a beneficial insect mm. Finbar I saw already saw a few lady beetles I would call them. Yeah. Are, they, are they playing much of a role at this early They're stage? They're also very important. They're also feeding on, on the natural, uh, the, the herbivore insects. So they eat eggs mainly. Um, also good uh, predators of aphids. And also the dragonfly. There's a lot of dragonfly flying around. Mm -hmm. One of the things when you think about insects in rice, you have to remember that in the water, another problem generated by rice is mosquitoes. And the dragonfly larvae live in the water. They have a very big uh, strong jaws and they prey on the dragon on the uh, mosquito larvae so they're keeping your mosquitoes down mm. so really there's a whole ecosystem here functioning to keep everything in order I mean one really has to look hard to see all these things I see a little spider web here and which yeah. some some little insects are caught in there what are those these are those midges that are flying around these are the decomposer midges, midges. so they're again uh, beneficial and spiders are very important uh, predators of things like plant hoppers, mainly plant hoppers. So, but, but you know, when I look around, I see lots of critters here, you know, insects of all kinds, of little things flying or crawling. Or, so, is that one well, of the reasons that some farmers think they have to spray because they see all these insects? Well, a lot of people don't understand what these insects are doing. So, a lot of people, when they see these swarms of midges, for example, that are decomposing the, the material, they think it's a pest and they'll spray. Uh, the same with the world maggot. One of the biggest problems with the world maggot is, is that it, it induces farmers to spray, mm. but we never see any yield reduction. The same with um, uh, leaf folder. Now our crop is finally starting to exert itself. It's within a week of maximum tillering, so it's, it's growing quite strongly now, and a lot of those gaps that we've had to live with for 
several weeks are finally starting to fill in, so we're feeling better. Uh, this week we're going to take the opportunity to talk about uh, what I would call the biotic influences on the crop and, and making an assessment of it. So that's how uh, animals, plants, funguses and viruses, how, how they're interacting with the crop, both beneficial and not beneficial. I have with me here Nancy Castillo, who, uh, who is a specialist in assessing uh, rice crops for, for the biotic influences and the level of injury that's coming from it. And Nancy and I will, will step through the process of assessing the rice crop for insects, for, um, for weeds, for and for diseases. for diseases, both from viruses and funguses. So, uh, in we go. So next week what we intend to do is that we will be collecting data on injuries caused by animal pests. Animal pests uh, uh, refer to insect pests, snails and rats. And then we will be also assessing injuries caused by diseases, um, viral diseases, bacterial diseases and um, um, fungal diseases and then we will be also uh, assessing uh, injuries caused by weeds. This is direct seeded rice. So we have here a quadrat, what we call as a, we call, we, we consider this some kind of a magic weapon. So this is equivalent to one heel in transplanted rice. So we, we would actually be sampling um, for, for diseases and insect and, uh, and uh, Insect injuries, we will be using um, 10 quadrats. We will be sampling from 10 quadrats. And then we would be also uh, taking, uh, um, we will be sampling weeds from three areas. Each area would be about one meter by one meter. So we would be assessing weeds relative to the height of the canopy and we will be recording the type of weeds that we will find. So we have a sweep net? Yes, this is a sweep net. We use this for uh, counting the flying insects, in this case mainly green leaf hoppers. Uh, green leaf hopper is the vector of tungrel. For the topping method, we have this small uh, pan here with water, it has a little detergent, and we use it for counting uh, sucking insects, like uh, plant hoppers, white back plant hoppers, brown plant hoppers, and then other in, in the surveys we do in other parts of the Philippines, we also ca catch rice bugs. Okay. Okay. Um, so, black bugs, rather. Black so, bugs. so with these these magic weapons, <laughs> yeah, uh, magic next week weapons. when the crop reaches the stage of maximum tillering, yeah. you'll make an assessment uh, according to our yeah. our data sheet, and then again uh, in the reproductive stage, in, in the grain filling and mature mature stage, uh, we'll make another assessment. That should give us a good idea of what biological things have done uh, both for and against our, our rice crop. Yeah, it's now about 45 days after sowing. So as you can see, uh, the crop starts elongating. So we have hit pretty much the, the end of the tillering and uh, it's now time for the crop to develop more biomass so you can see it's got uh, quite a few nice looking tillers here in this place and the stem starts uh, elongating now yeah, so we're coming then gradually closer to what will then be the next stage panicle initiation when the uh, the next thing that we, we also did today like we said last week already uh, Nancy's team just uh, went through around here and they just did a, an assessment of all the uh, different kinds of crop damage that we might have had uh, so diseases insects weeds even rats uh, so we'll see what they have found out uh, but they went across the whole field and stopped at about 30 locations to assess what, we, what we've got there. So that'll be uh, interesting information and a bit more objective than what we saw ourselves. Sometimes we are getting biased by thinking, okay, we've got this problem and this problem and this problem. But they've done it in a very systematic manner and we will see uh, what they have. So, but when you just sort of look around uh, the whole field here, uh, from the distance, uh, it starts looking actually quite okay. 
so we've got a pretty good uh, dense uh, green canopy building up. So if we can support this now with enough nutrients and good water management and we don't run into more pest problems, we should be okay. After sowing, so the crop is uh, moving into heading stage. You can see it's getting quite tall. So uh, what I'm doing here today is I'm going to check whether we need a little bit more nitrogen. So just looking at it, I have the feeling that there are some places where it gets a little bit yellowish, and we know that right now we need a lot of nitrogen because the panicles are formed, and we want to make sure that there's no limitation of that important nutrient. So the tool that I'm using for this is this. Uh, leaf color chart which has uh, four different shades of green and uh, it should guide me whether I need an extra little bit of nitrogen or not. So what I'm basically doing is I'm walking through the field and I've been taking about 15-20 readings at different places and whenever I hit the spot I'll basically take a leaf, uh, the uppermost leaf, I'll put it on the chart in the middle of the leaf and I find the green shade that matches the color of the leaf uh, best. So this one here is matching perfectly the shade number three and that basically tells us that we're getting a little bit low already. Yeah? But I have to take of course many readings uh, because there's some variability in the leaf. And uh, I've done this now, so I've just finished this uh, and I've concluded that on average my leaf color chart reading is actually less than three. Uh, so it's between 2.5 and three in many cases. So that's why I've decided to put on an extra amount of about 25 kg of nitrogen as urea at this stage and that should probably complete our whole fertilizer application regime. Other than that, uh, at this uh, stage of the crop there is really uh, nothing we can do at this point. I saw some weeds coming up here and there. Uh, no insect damage really that I'm worried about right now, so our decision to not uh, spray any insecticide so far seems to work out. And the rest now, we need to wait and hope for more sunshine so that hopefully we'll still get some kind of decent yield. So we start with a visual estimate. Of, of how ready the crop is and we, we, we first look at the, the proportion of yellow grains, the proportion of straw yellow grains. Now Martin has suggested an ideal amount for harvest would be 80% yellow. Now in front of me here, we always have an issue as to whether it's representative or not, it's probably 50 to 60% yellow, something of that order. It's not quite ready yet. Now a more objective and professional way to assess how uh, how ready the crop is will be to measure its moisture content. Yep, and this is one way to do that. This is a moisture meter, so-called moisture meter. It measures the resistance of the crop, which is uh, basically dependent on the moisture content. And you have a small sample tray. So you take a, a sample from a panicle. As Lee said, 80% of the, of the grains should be straw yellow. That basically says 80% of one panicle. Getting representative is always a challenge. There's almost no. It's a challenge, yeah. Or <laughs> so, so uh, you take a small sample like this, fill it in there, and then uh, what you do with this instrument, basically, you crush it. Oops, can I give you this? You, you turn the knob and crush it, turn it all the way to the end, and then uh, you measure the resistance, and that gets translated in the reading of the moisture content. And in it, it this case, it's 21.6 percent. Now, what we're going to do is mix the greener one I've, I've, I've harvested. And because this is a very small sample, it's not really representative neither for a small si uh, plot nor for the field. So what you have to do is you have to, in one location, you should do different, at least three different measurements. So now in this sample, for example, you have a lot more green grains than in the previous one. So the reading should be a lot higher. Ooh, 27.9%. And you would take 
at least three samples and then you have a button here where you can average the readings and then you get the average reading for that uh, location. And then what you have to do is basically also measure in a representative way in the field because uh, the crop doesn't mature evenly everywhere in the field. So Lee is just getting a sample from another location. <laughs> Doing my best to stay on my feet. <laughs> Trying to find a green one. <laughs> Probably semi respectable. Yeah. So there's still a lot of straw particles in there. Not very well threshed. Um, what you want to have is only grains in there. And it should be basically just one layer of grains or a little bit more than that. So we crush it again, take our reading. 27.7 and we can't do an average because I just did that and we only have one more reading in the moment. So it's well and truly above 24, it might be 27, 28, 29, something like that. Yeah, in there we measured around up to 30%. We did. So, so I think it's probably around 28, 29. We're facing the final tricky decision to irrigate or not to irrigate, that is the question. So we're considering how moist the soil is now how moist is the soil now? Moist. Right. <laughs> we're, we're considering what the weather's like. What's the weather like? Hot. Dry. And we're considering how long we'd expect until we harvest. Now consensus is about 10 days to two weeks, something mm. of that range. It'll be close to two weeks time before you're back to do the deed. So we need this to last to to finish properly, I think it needs the two weeks. But it's moist, it's heavy clay, and we do want our combine to stay on the ground, not to explore the underground. I vote keep it dry. Yeah, I would have, if it was an experiment and I knew that we would be doing hand harvesting, I would put on another irrigation just for safety. But we need to figure out that we have to come and visit combine and so the carrying capacity of that soil will be the deciding factor and we can't delay harvest because we see some lodging coming in so I'll go with the majority vote. Yeah, I agree. So <laughs> no more irrigation, let's see. But I pray for a little bit of rain tonight maybe. <laughs> well on recent patterns I think you'll probably have that, have that wish granted. So there we have it, we won't irrigate again and we'll It'll be in approximately two weeks we'll come back and harvest about May 2nd. Yeah, I was on a trip last week and then Lee sent me a note that we had 70% lodging too. When I came back uh, yesterday afternoon the first thing I did was rush out to the field and then this is what I saw. That's a lot more than 70%, so it's basically a complete mess uh, now lodging. Uh, I guess there can be many reasons for this, but probably the primary reason is uh, we've had a broadcast zone crop, which is not anchored very deep in the, in the soil. We had unnecessary rain now, I would say. <laughs> unnecessary rain. <right? laughs> and you can see it's all lodging in one direction here, so we must have had some wind too. I don't think we had too much nitrogen, although that obviously sometimes contributes too. Mm -hmm. So what we're going to do now, Lee? We're going to harvest it. So as I explained in an, in an earlier clip, there's one one crucial advantage if we if we take this section of crop here, it's lodged, but there's still some airspace under the crop. There's three or four inches of of airspace under there, and that's a crucial difference. The combine. The combine won't have too much trouble as long as we're careful. Um, if it gets flatter than that, then we are in real mm. trouble. And that's that's the concern. Ideally, we probably should wait one more day. Mm. But there's already threatening looking clouds over there, so I think it might be time to act before it gets any worse. Yeah, and we had another rain yesterday afternoon, so I'm getting nervous too. It is still quite wet underneath here, but uh as long as we get through with the combine and pull it up, uh, well, I think we have no choice. Uh, let's, let's try it. Yeah, I think we need to get an initial cut. Yeah, yeah initial uh, cut. And yeah. then after that, 
you could do. Yeah. You could have some you know, the operation. It is easy. Did you just did you just pause? Well, I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> That's nice. Yeah. Not perfect, but nice. Well, I had a lot of trouble going that way. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> the rice now we're at the business end where we mill the rice into a product to eat so uh, the first thing that happened after we harvested the rice is we took it to dry it it was at a moisture content of about 21 percent from memory and we took it and dried it in a flatbed dryer down to a moisture of about 14 percent so Martin's going to uh, measure the moisture content of a sample before our eyes and hopefully it's what I claim it is yeah so I can't actually measure the sample uh, that, that has been in the mill because uh, it's already milled. Yeah. But I have another sample here. And uh, the ideal moisture content for, for milling is between 13 and 14 percent. And uh, so the first step would basically be to measure the moisture content. And this is an example for a moisture meter, the Erie moisture meter. You, you put a small sample of grains in there and then you crush them. And then by measuring the resistance, it gives you the moisture content. And this uh, basically tells you that uh, the sample that we have is still too wet. We couldn't use that for milling. So that's more than 16%? It's more, more than 14%. More than 14 and, In this case. And, and uh, basically this would also tell us if it's right for milling, between 12 and 14%, or whether it's right for seeds. What happens if you mill it when it's wetter than 14%? If you mill it wetter, then the grain is very soft, and, and we get a lot of damage in the, in the rice mill by uh, basically the, the uh, crushed. machines uh, crushing crushing the grains and, and so your milling yield would be a lot lower. And what if it's too dry? If it's too dry, then it's too brittle and again you get, uh, because of mechanical stress, you get more cracking uh, because it's so brittle and again you get more, more losses. Okay, okay. And, so, and so for the drying there are different options. Uh, the, this grain was dried in a flatbed dryer uh, and but the flatbed dryer is a very simple technology that can be locally produced and produces a reasonably good quality. But then there are also more sophisticated dryers, like we have one over there, which is a so-called recirculating batch dryer, which allows us to produce really the optimum quality of, of the paddy before we do the milling. After the, the grain has been dried uh, to the appropriate moisture content, it's, it's then delivered to the mill. And the first stage is the dehulling, where we have two rubber rollers set at a, a very close clearance to each other. And one roller is traveling just a little bit slower than the other roller. And that, that abrasion motion, that, that pincer motion, removes the husk from the rice. It then goes on to a gravity table, which then, in a, in a horizontal reciprocating motion, uh, it, it's on a slight angle. And that successfully removes the, the hulled rice, the hulled brown rice, from the rice that was not successfully hulled. And the rice that was not successfully hulled goes back to be de-hulled again. After that it goes through three stages of polishing. An abrasion stone polisher, a friction polisher, and then you also have a choice of a mist polisher if you want that final, shall I call it sheen, <laughs> uh, for a really quality, uh, quality, high quality product that really looks as desirable as it tastes. And there's one final process after the polishing process. It's then, it's then graded for size, both through a rotary sifter and through a length grader. And that separates the whole rice from the broken rice. The final stage in a sophisticated rice mill is the colour sorter, which is an ingenious piece of technology that, that runs uh, streams of, of, of milled rice grain in a, in a single grain stream. Uh, there's, there's sensors that sense the colour of individual grains and if the colour does not, is not white enough, basically, that could be from poor milling, it could be because it's a foreign object like a stone, there's nothing as much fun as a stone in your rice. Uh, a, a short, sharp jet of uh, 
uh, compressed air will remove the grain. And so the, those, that final high standard sorting process is, is quite a common process in, in high standard rice mills. And then hence you have the finished product. Uh, whole grain, well milled rice with a known quantity of brokens in it. And that's really the objective of the whole process. The good news is we made a profit. That's good. Not a huge profit, but a profit. So we grew 5.24 tonnes to the hectare of rice and we valued it at 14 pesos per, per kilogram here in the Philippines, which is equivalent to about 30 US cents or $300 per tonne of paddy rice. In summary, I doubt these figures are particularly visible to the film, we earned $440 from the field, we spent $350 growing it, so we made, according to this, $84 in profit, which at least pays for the coffee we're drinking and a fair bit more. Well, that's for the field, but uh, if we extrapolate this to a whole hectare, which is what a normal farmer would probably have, so that's a net profit of $335 per hectare. So, is that a normal profit? Is uh, that what a farmer would be happy? I think happy it's uh, um, probably quite common, uh, particularly if you have deep well irrigation mm. uh, to, and pumping costs to cover. Yeah? If uh, you are an irrigated farmer in the Philippines who uh, has access to canal water or for irrigation scheme water, the typical profit is probably more like $500 per hectare. Uh, that's uh, what I remember measuring once. Uh, so we are below that, but that's primarily really the reason uh, is because of the high irrigation costs. You know, so which, which probably explains, as you look across the rice growing world, that dry season rice is generally confined to those locations where water is easy and cheap to access. Yeah, it has to do that exactly way. that reason. Good, I think that wraps it up. Um, We've not become rich, uh, at least we haven't lost money. I think we've learned a lot. Yeah. We have. So we'll promise to do better next time. Right? Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>